The knee is the biggest and potentially most complicated joint. It joins the upper and lower leg and allows both hinge and rotating movement. Its function is complex as it needs to allow flexibility during movement, but also provides stability when standing up. Multiple ligaments exist to restrict motion to desired planes. These ligaments are generally very strong, but as you can see in these videos, the knee is often subjected to a multitude of potentially damaging forces. It is thus important to be able to recognize injury as not only are the ligaments essential for knee function, but knee function is essential for most everyday activities. In this video, we are going to revise the anatomy of the knee and its ligaments, as well as common mechanisms of injury. We will also demonstrate how to test these clinically, as well as briefly touch on how to diagnose these injuries on imaging. The knee is a bicondylar type synovial joint. It is formed by articulations between the patella, femur, and tibia. It consists of two articulations, the tibiofemoral, which is the weight-bearing point of the knee, and the patellofemoral. This forms part of the quadriceps femoris tendon, which attaches onto the tibial tuberosity, and the patella lies inside the tendon. These are the menisci. These are two fibrocartilaginous structures, namely the medial meniscus and lateral meniscus. Anterior to the menisci is the transverse ligament of the knee. The function of the menisci are to increase joint stability and to act as shock absorbers. The ligaments of the knee. There is the patella and then there are the collaterals. The lateral collateral prevents lateral movement of the tibia and then there is the medial collateral. This prevents medial movement of the tibia. Then there are the cruciates. They connect the tibia to the femur. The anterior cruciate, this prevents anterior movement of the tibia. And then there is the posterior cruciate, which prevents posterior movement of the tibia. This is a posterior view of the knee showing the medial and lateral femoral condyles, the medial and lateral menisci, the posterior and anterior cruciates, and the posterior meniscofemoral ligament. Here are lateral and medial views of the knee showing the same structures which have previously been said. Moving on to examining the ligaments of the knee. It is important to remember, as with any exam, to examine the joints below and above, as well as to look feel and move. For the purpose of this video, however, we are going to skip straight to testing the ligaments. Just as a recap, flexion should be roughly 135 degrees and extension roughly zero. Inability to extend actively could indicate an extensor tear or fractured patella, whereas inability to extend passively could mean a locked knee as in the case of a damaged meniscus. Let's start off by testing the ACL and PCL. Start by looking. Look for a posterior sag and tibial step off, which are both for the PCL. Tests you do are the Lachman test at 15 degrees and the draw test at 90 degrees. Look for a tibial step off on the anterior side of the knee. Normally, the femur should be about 1 cm posterior to the tibia. You may also palpate this along the joint line to be able to feel better. A tibial step off should have a corresponding posterior sag. This indicates loss of PCL function and will be seen as the femur hanging lower than the tibia posteriorly. The Lachman test is done at 15 degrees. Here you try and sublux the knee anteriorly and posteriorly to check the integrity of the ligaments. The draw test is pretty much identical to the Lachman test just at 90 degrees. Contrary to what the rheumatologists say, you should sit on the patient's foot and firmly pull the tibia towards and push it away from you, all while feeling the joint line for any extra movement. Testing the collaterals. Here you perform medial and lateral stress tests. Each one you do at both 0 and 20 degrees, because instability at 20 only indicates isolated collateral injury, whereas instability at both 20 and 0 degrees indicates an additional ACL or PCL pathology. 
To do the stress test, firmly pull the tibia side to side, attempting to sublux it at the joint. Do this at both 20 degrees, as mentioned, and at 0 degrees. The last thing we need to test for is meniscal injuries. Here there are two tests, the McMurray test and the Steinman test, which will be demonstrated shortly. Positive tests are where there is a click, a crunch, or pain elicited. The McMurray test involves flexing at the hip, internally rotating the foot, applying a varus force at the knee, and extending. Then, do the same, this time with external rotation at the foot, a valgus force at the knee, and extend. Remember, we're looking for clicks, crunches, and pain. To do the Steinman test, flex the knee and let it hang at 90 degrees. Then, sharply internally and externally rotate at the foot. As with most clinical cases, investigations can assist in making a diagnosis. Starting with the plain radiograph, these are generally not so useful. However, especially in children, you may see avulsions where the ligaments attach, or calcifications if there's been chronic injury. Here's an example of an ACL injury which has caused avulsion at the intercondyloid eminence. Here we see a PCL injury with avulsion at the posterior intercondylar area. We do the same with LCL. There's avulsion of the fibula attachment at the fibula head. In this x-ray, avulsion at the medial epicondyl of the femur can be seen with the MCL attached. This x-ray is an example of the calcification alluded to earlier due to long-standing chronic inflammation and injury of the MCL. MRIs are the gold standard of imaging. They are quite easy to interpret as long as you know your anatomy and remember that ligaments should be taut, thin and well defined. Here is a picture to remind you of the anatomy of the MCL. It is easy to see though that in picture A there is a normal intact thin MCL whereas in picture B the MCL is ruptured and appears as curly black lines. The same can be said for the torn lateral collateral ligament seen on the right. The same applies to this MRI of the ACL. The menisci are a bit harder to see on imaging. So, from a lateral view, from the medial side, the medial meniscus can be seen as two triangular shapes forming a bow tie. It is normal for the posterior bow tie area to be larger than the anterior bow tie area. These are called the anterior and posterior horns, respectively. A lateral view of the lateral meniscus seems the same bow tie formation, except this time the triangles are roughly the same size. Any pathology in the menisci will change these triangles, as seen here in a medial meniscus tear. Here is another example where the posterior horn is actually folded over, over the anterior horn. When looking at the coronal views, there are also two triangles. The most important thing, however, here is that the two triangles have points facing medially which are sharp and well defined. These next two MRIs demonstrate loss of the sharpness of the points of the inside of the triangles. These are indications of meniscal pathology on the coronal views, both anteriorly and posteriorly. That brings our video to an end. Thank you for taking the time to watch it. We hope you learned something and good luck for the OSCEs.